Chapter 13 Alec waited in the machine room, wondering when the signal would come. He loosened another button on his jacket. Dr. Barlow had made the room as hot as an oven tonight. She always seemed to add more heaters when Alec watched the eggs, just to annoy him. At least he wouldn't have to suffer much longer. He could already hear the distant rumble of glow plugs firing on the starboard pod. Klopp, Hoffman, and Bauer were up there pretending to work on the engine, and being noisy about it so no one would be surprised to see Alec heading up to help. After the disastrous start of Dr. Barlow's mission today, the escape plan had changed. Alec had watched the elephant-shaped walker's hasty return, carrying no supplies, its side spattered with some sort of red dust. Rumors had spread through the ship that the walker had been attacked, an incident in which dozens of civilians had been injured. Within an hour, angry crowds had arrived at the airfield's gate, threatening to attack the Leviathan. Guards were posted at all of the airship's hatches now, and a ring of Ottoman soldiers surrounded the gondola. There would be no sneaking out through the cargo deck tonight. From his station up in the engine pod, however, Klopp had reported that no one was guarding the mooring tower. It was connected to the air beast's head by a single cable that hung 80 meters in the air. If the five of them could climb across and down, perhaps they could escape across the darkened airfield. Alec listened to the engine misfiring, waiting for the signal. Now that the captain considered him a prisoner of war, he was happy to leave the airship behind. He'd been a fool to let himself grow so attached. Volga was right. Pretending that this flying abomination was his home had led only to misery. Dylan might have been a good friend in some other world, but not this one. There it was. Five sharp coughs from the glow plugs. The signal meant that Bauer and Hoffman had subdued the Darwinist crewmen in the pod. Volger would be headed up from his stateroom. They were really leaving. Tonight. Alec adjusted the eggs one last time. He picked up a fresh heater and shook it to life, then tucked it into the hay. As hot as the machine room was, Dr. Barlow's mysterious cargo would most likely be fine until dawn. In any case, it wasn't his concern anymore. Alec noticed an old smear of grease on the egg box and rubbed a finger across it. Then he drew a stripe across his cheeks, as if he'd been working up in the engine pod. If anyone saw him, they would assume that Dylan was down here with the eggs and that Alec was fetching parts for the engineers. He stood and hefted his toolbox. It was stuffed with spare clothes and the wireless set from the Stormwalker. The set was heavy, but once he and his men were hidden in the wilds, radio might be their only means of contact with the outside world. Alec sighed. Here aboard the Leviathan, he'd almost forgotten how lonely it was to run and hide. The door opened with a soft squeak, and he stared out into the hall, listening to the murmurs of the ship. A small tapping noise reached his ears. Was someone headed this way? He swore softly. It was probably Dylan coming to talk one last time. Seeing the boy again would only make this harder, and Alec needed to start toward the engine pod. But the noise was coming from behind him. He turned around. One of the eggs was moving. In the rosy light of the heaters, he could see a tiny hole forming at the top of the egg. Little chips were breaking free and sliding down the smooth white surface. Fleck by fleck, the hole grew larger. Alex stood there, his hand on the doorknob. He should be heading up, leaving these godless creatures behind. But he'd spent seven long nights watching the eggs and wondering what would emerge from them. In another few moments, he would finally see. Alec pulled the door softly closed. The odd thing was, it was the middle egg hatching, the one Dr. Barlow had said was sick. Something was poking its way out of the hole now. It looked like a claw. Or was it a paw? There was pale fur on it, not feathers. A small black nose poked its way out, sniffing the air. Alec wondered if the creature was dangerous. Of course, it was only a baby, and he had a rigging knife sheathed on his belt. 
but Alex stayed close to the door, just in case. The beast emerged slowly, reaching out to grip the edge of the box with tiny four-fingered hands. Its fur was damp, and its huge eyes blinked in the glow of the heaters. It looked about attentively, twitching as it pulled itself farther from the broken egg. God's wounds! But the thing was homely! Its skin seemed too large for its body, drooping like an old man's. It reminded Alec of his aunt's hairless cat, bred for its bizarre looks. The beast stared at him and made a soft, plaintive noise. You must be hungry, Alec said softly, but he hadn't the first idea what it ate. At least it was clear enough that the creature didn't eat humans. It was far too small for that, and too... appealing, even with its strange excess of skin. Somehow the large eyes seemed wise and sad. Alec found himself wanting to pick the animal up and comfort it. The creature extended a tiny hand. Alec put down the toolkit and took a step closer. When he reached out a hand, the animal touched his fingertips, squeezing them one by one. Then it leaned forward, letting itself slide from the edge of the egg box. Alec caught it just in time. Even in the sweltering machine room, the creature's body felt warm, its short fur as soft as a chinchilla coat his mother had always worn in winter. When Alec held it closer, the beast made a cooing noise. The huge eyes blinked slowly, staring straight into his. Thin arms wrapped around Alec's wrist. It was strange how the creature didn't give him the same uneasy feeling as other Darwinist creations. It was too small and sleepy-looking and gave off an air of preternatural calm. The engine sputtered again and Alec realized that he was behind schedule. I'm sorry, he whispered, but I have to go. He placed the creature back in the box amid the warm glow of the heaters, but as his hands pulled away, the animal made a high-pitched mewling noise. Shush, Alec breathed softly. Someone will be along soon. He wondered if that were true. Dylan would be here at dawn, but that was hours away. He took a step backward, kneeling to pick up the tool kit. The creature's eyes grew wider, and it let out another cry that ended in a high, sweeping note, as pure as a flute. Alec frowned. That last sound was oddly like the whistles the crew used to command their beasts. And it was loud enough to wake someone up. He reached out again, shushing the creature. The instant his hand touched it, the animal went silent. Alec knelt there for a moment, stroking the soft fur. Finally, the large eyes closed, and Alec dared to pull away. The beast instantly sprang awake and began to mule again. Alec swore. This was absurd, being held hostage by this newborn. He turned away and crossed the room. But as the door opened, the screams shifted into a burst of whistling noises. The glowworms in the machine room reacted, green lights spilling from the walls. Alec imagined the whole airship waking up, message lizards scampering from all directions in response to the creature's cries. Quiet, he whispered, but the beast didn't stop until he went back and picked it up again. As Alec stood there stroking its pale fur, he came to a horrible realization. To have any hope of escaping, he had to take the newborn animal with him. He could hardly leave it sitting here, bawling its tiny misshapen head off for the whole ship to hear. He had no idea what to feed the creature, or how to take care of it, or even what it was. And what would Count Volger say when he showed up with this abomination in his arms? But Alec didn't have much choice. When he lifted the animal up from the hay, it scampered up his arm and clung to his shoulder like a cat. The tiny claws stuck fast in the wool of his mechanic's suit. It looked at him expectantly. We're going for a walk now, he said softly, hefting the toolkit again. You're going to stay quiet, right? The creature blinked at him, a look of smug satisfaction on its face. Alex sighed 
and went to the door. He opened it again, looking up and down the corridor. No one was coming to investigate the strange noises. Not yet, anyway. He loosened his jacket, ready to shove the creature inside if he encountered anyone, but for the moment the animal seemed happy on his shoulder, and quiet. It felt as light as a bird there, as if designed to travel this way. Designed, Alec thought. This animal was fabricated, not born of nature. It had some purpose in the Darwinists' plans, a role in Dr. Barlow's schemes to keep the Ottomans out of the war. And he had no idea what that purpose was. Alec shuddered once, then strode into the darkened hall. Chapter 14 There you are, Count Volger called softly from the support strut of the engine pod. We'd almost given up on you. Alec made his way along the rat lines, feeling the creature move inside his jacket. It was flexing its claws again like tiny needles piercing his flesh. I had a small problem. Did someone see you? Alec shrugged. A few crewmen on the way, but they didn't ask where I was headed. You play a very convincing broken engine, Maestro Klopp. From down in the pod, the Master of Mechanics saluted, a broad smile on his face. Beside him was a very angry-looking Mr. Hurst, gagged and bound fast to the control panel. Then it's time to get moving, Vulgar said. I trust you're all ready for a fight if it comes to that. Bauer and Hoffman brandished tools in their hands, and Vulgar was wearing his saber. But Alec could hardly wield a knife with the creature hiding under his coat. The time to tell them was now, not in the middle of the escape. There's still my small problem. Vulgar frowned. What are you talking about? What happened? Just as I was leaving, one of Dr. Barlow's eggs hatched. Some sort of beast came out. Quite a loud one. When I tried to leave, it began to howl, like a newborn baby crying, I suppose. I thought it would wake the whole ship up. Vulgar nodded. So you had to strangle it. Most unpleasant, I'm sure. But they won't find its body till morning, and by then we'll be long gone. Alec blinked. You did get rid of it, didn't you, Alec? In fact, that strategy didn't cross my mind. Inside his jacket, the creature moved, and Alec winced. Vulgar put a hand on his sword hilt and hissed. What in blazes is under your coat? I assure you, I have no idea. Alec cleared his throat. But it's perfectly well behaved as long as one doesn't try to abandon it. You brought it with you? Vulgar leaned closer. In case it has escaped your notice, your highness, we are currently trying to escape the Darwinists. If you have one of their abominations with you, kindly fling it over the side. Alec tightened his grip on the rat lines. I certainly will not, Count. For one thing, the beast would make considerable noise on the way down. Vulgar groaned softly, his fists unclenching. Very well, then. I suppose if it comes to a fight, we could use it as a hostage. Alec nodded, unbuttoning his jacket. The creature poked its head out. Vulgar turned away with a shudder. Just keep it quiet, or I shall silence it myself. After you, your highness. Alec began to make his way toward the bow, the others following in silence. They climbed along the rat lines just above the airship's waist, the ropes sagging under the weight of the five men and their heavy bags. It was slow going, and poor old Klopp wore a look of terror on his face, but at least no one on the spine could see them. When the newborn beast began to squirm, Alec opened his jacket the rest of the way. It crawled out and climbed onto his shoulder, its huge eyes narrowing in the breeze. Just be careful, he whispered, and stay quiet. The creature turned to him with a bored expression, as if Alec were saying something terribly obvious. Soon, the awful flechette bats were everywhere. The bow of the airship was covered with them, a seething mass of small black shapes, all softly clucking. 
Dylan had once explained to Alec that the clicks made echoes, which the creatures used to see in the dark. They had eyes as well. A thousand beady pairs were following Alec expectantly. No matter how carefully he moved, the bats fluttered about him. It was like trying to sneak through a flock of pigeons on a footpath. Why are they watching us so keenly? Klopp whispered. They think we're here to feed them, Alec said. Dylan always feeds the bats at night. You mean they're hungry? Klopp asked, his face shiny with sweat in the moonlight. Not to worry, they eat figs, Alec said, leaving out the part about metal spikes. I'm glad to hear, Klopp began, but suddenly a bat fluttered up in front of him. As it shot past his face, his boots slipped from the rat lines. Klopp jerked to a halt a moment later, his hands white-knuckled on the ropes, but his large body swung onto the side of the airship's membrane, sending it billowing out in all directions. Around them, bats launched into the air, their clicking noises changing into shrieks and calls. Alec grabbed for Klopp's wrist as the man struggled to get his feet back on the ropes. A moment later, he was safe. But the disturbance was spreading, bats fluttering outward like ripples in a dark pond. We're done for now, Alec thought. The creature on his shoulder perked up, its claws sinking painfully into Alec's shoulder. A soft, clucking noise came from its mouth, the sound the bats had been making a moment before. Keep that beast, Vulgar hissed, but Alec waved him silent. All around them, the bats were growing quieter. The screeches faded out, the carpet of black shapes settling back onto the airship's skin. The creature went silent and turned its big-eyed gaze upon Alec again. He stared back at it. Had the thing, whatever it was, just silenced the flechette bats? Perhaps by accident. It was some kind of mimic like the message lizards, and yet the creature had required no training, no mothering at all. Perhaps that was the way with all newborn Darwinist beasts. Keep moving, Vulgar whispered, and Alec did. The mooring tower stretched into the air before them, but Alec found himself staring downward. In the foggy darkness, the ground seemed to be a thousand kilometers below. Does that rope look strong enough? He asked Hoffman. The man knelt to feel the slender cable that stretched across to the tower, perhaps thirty meters away. It seemed too thin to hold a man's weight, though the Darwinists' fabricated materials were always stronger than they looked. From what I've seen, sir, the heavy cables are all attached to the gondola below, but this must be here for some reason. Pretty useless if it can't hold a man's weight. I suppose, Alec said. You could think of other creatures that could use the cable. It might be for message lizards to dart across, or for strafing hawks to roost on. Hoffman shrugged a loop of rope from his shoulder. This line will hold any two of us, along with our gear. We should send someone over carrying one end of it. I'll go, Alec said. Not with your injury, young master, Klopp said. I'm the lightest of us, Alec held out his hand. Give me the rope. Klopp looked at Vulgar, who nodded and said, Tie that around his waist so he doesn't kill himself. Alec raised an eyebrow, a little surprised that Vulgar was letting him go first. The Wild Count read his expression and smiled. If that cable breaks, we'll all be stuck here, so it hardly matters who goes first. And you are the lightest after all. So my foolhardiness has produced the correct strategy, Count? Even a stopped clock is right twice a day. Alec didn't answer, but the creature bristled on his shoulder, as if sensing his annoyance. Klopp let out a chuckle as he knelt and tied the heavier rope around Alec's waist. Soon it was secure, the other end gripped by Bauer, Hoffman, and Klopp in a tug-of-war line. Quickly now! Vulgar said. Alec nodded and turned away, walking down the slope of the air beast's head. The others let the rope out slowly, a gentle pull at his waist. 
It reminded Alec of when he was ten and his father would let him lean out from a castle parapet, keeping a firm hand on his belt. Of course, back then he'd felt much safer. The slender cable stretched out ahead, disappearing among the dark struts of the mooring tower. Alec grasped the cable in both hands. I hope you're not afraid of heights, beastie. The newborn creature just looked at him and blinked. Right then, Alec said, and stepped off into the void. He dangled for a moment from his hands, then swung his legs up to wrap them around the cable. Though its claws sank deep into his shoulder, the beastie didn't make a sound. There was one good thing about hanging face up like this. Alec couldn't see the dark ground below, only his own hands clenching the rope and the stars above. He pulled himself away from the airship, hand over hand, the cable cutting into the backs of his knees as he inched along. Halfway across, Alec was breathing hard. His injured rib had begun to throb and his hands were losing feeling. The night air turned the sweat on his forehead cold. As he inched away from the airship, the rope hanging from his waist grew longer and heavier. He imagined the cable snapping, or his fingers slipping. He would fall for an awful moment, but the rope around his waist would swing him back toward the airship, smashing him into its nose. Maybe hard enough for the whale itself to awake in protest. The mooring tower got closer, but the cable in his aching hand sloped gently upward now, and was harder than ever to climb. The creature began to moan softly mimicking the wind in the struts of the tower. Alec gritted his teeth and pulled himself the last few meters, ignoring his burning muscles. For once he was thankful for the years of Vulgar's cruel fencing lessons. Finally, a metal strut came within reach, and Alec wrapped an arm around it. He hung there for a moment, panting, then hauled himself up onto the cold steel of the tower. With shaking fingers, he untied the thick rope from around his waist and knotted it to the strut. Now that it stretched all the way back to the airship's head, the rope seemed to weigh a ton. How had he carried it so far? Alec lay on his back and watched as the others prepared to cross, dividing up the satchels of tools and weapons. It was odd to see the Leviathan from this head-on perspective. It made Alec feel insignificant, like some minuscule creature about to be swallowed by a whale. But the darkness beyond the airship was vaster still. It was dotted with the fires of the protesters at the airfield gate, and past those, the lights of the city. Constantinople, he said softly. Hmm, Constantinople, the creature said.